Thank you for that, Sue. Um, I thought it was, it was interesting the way you started in talking about the systematic um, disparities and challenge around, it's not me, it's my magnetic personality, um, and the challenge around equity and equality uh, and, and the differences between those and what they mean and, and the gaps that that lack of capability and confidence can create um, within, within society. Um, and in fact, that, that it's easy to serve connected, capable and confident people, or the less confused, um, and, and how do we serve the rest? Uh, and, it, and it was also great to have a bit of uh, information and, and to spur some of that thinking around the complexity of the Australian environment with the federal and the state. Um, and I know some of us had a conversation about that last night, about how that differs within the New Zealand context because we don't have that extra layer. Um, I would also, being that you mentioned Australians and New Zealanders, I'd just like to thank the panel for nobody mentioning the rugby. It would be very inappropriate for us to mention the rugby, so um, we won't mention the rugby at all. Right, so now we, we come to the part where um, there's an opportunity for um, some engagement with the panel as well. Um, we've got a couple of mics. Barb, I wonder if maybe the panel could have one of the mics and then um, I think Barb will rove. Is there anybody that would like to start with an opening question? I do have one I can pose if people are feeling a little bit... Oh, no, we're right. Um, and perhaps if we could just make sure that we wait until people have got the mic and just introduce yourself by saying your name and where you're from as well. Hello. Ooh. <laughs> Helga Arlington, um, formerly a librarian, law librarian, now a local board member in Auckland. Um, I'm wondering, this is a question for both Colin and Alison, I'm wondering whether as New Zealand approaches online voting, whether there will be the possibility for future voters to participate or to learn actively with a dummy system perhaps in libraries that will give people a sense of what online voting will be like. Um, the, the, I guess the short answer is uh, I don't know. I, I think it's a really interesting idea. Uh, and I think if, if we were to kind of expand the the, the, the question a little to the sort of general question of the role of, of libraries. I, th I think there is, is, there's a really important role here for, for making, um, f for making important services accessible and available. And part of that is, is good design. You know, I thought your point about the, the you know, the Auckland Spatial Plan was, was really well made. What a great idea to put the spatial plan available online, but my goodness, geospatial files are horrendously large. So, so, so a good idea, but, but maybe something went wrong in the execution. And I think, I think we're in that, that kind of lumpy stage at the moment where we are, you know, we're, we're moving into this digital age, digital government, digital participation, whatever it might be, and we are, we are learning our way forward. And some of the things we need to do, I think, are, are very much about, yes, the user experience, making it as accessible and easy as possible, but also accepting that no matter how well you do that, for some people, um, and perhaps some services will always be difficult and people will need help. So how do we, how do we put the right support around them? And I think voting is a great example of that. Um, I guess because it's such an important activity uh, that, that that may well be the one where we say, well, look, let's, let's try something a little bit different here. So I think that's a really neat idea, and I'll, I mean, I'll kind of tuck that away and go and talk to the folk who are, who are thinking about how they might do that. Um, thank you, Helga. I um, also think it's a potentially a really good idea. I know that when we did the online census. A lot of pe people completed their census uh, in libraries, and some people required a degree of staff assistance, and there were some challenges in there in terms of the staff assisting somebody who was entering very private information and the degree to which the customer trusted the librarian to be there or not. And I think voting is a step again, and so, being able to show somebody online how to do the voting with a dummy system and then leave them 
on their own so that they can make their vote, cast their vote in, in a situation of true privacy is really important. One question down the back, and then we'll come up to you, Philip. Uh, kia ora koutou, Jan Rivers. Um, my question relates to the comments that have been made about GIS systems, and it seems to me that one of the really um, clearly missing opportunities for um, openness and transparency in terms of public information is the lack of a publicly accessible geospatial place where uh, members of the community and people outside government can experiment with geospatial layers. Um. <laughs> you reckon that's mine, do you? <laughs> I mean, I think, yeah, that, that's, that's uh, an interesting perspective. It, I think as, as a former chief executive of LINS, I'm uh, very excited about the possibilities that geospatial analysis and geospatial um, imaging and uh, bring, but I'm also very aware it's, it's, a, it's one of these incredibly complex areas and people find it, I mean, even very smart people find it very difficult to, to really grasp um, the use of geospatial to the extent that perhaps um, I think would be, could be beneficial. So I think it's a very, I mean, it's an interesting idea. I think it's a very difficult topic. I mean, I, I can remember um, just as, a, as an anecdote when, when we were, when we were putting together the implementation of, um, of Auckland, the Auckland uh, Super City, as, as it was called at the time. There was a lot of development work being done on the spatial plan. Uh, really, really good work in Auckland. And, and actually, quite frankly, central government were quite a way behind. Uh, and I worked really quite hard with central government colleagues, heads of policy in departments, to try and get them to understand the the opportunity that geospatial presented. And I have to say, I failed miserably. <laughs> it, it was a really hard sell because they, they, you know, they couldn't get their head around it. So I, I, I think it's a really interesting idea, but, but I, from my experience, it's, quite a, it's a really tough area. Just um, to add to that, in terms of the importance of the online version, the, the print versions of the unitary plan, the draft unitary plan that had to be printed to go into libraries were in the vicinity of $1,500 to $2,000 each because they were just, you know, a one mass of documents and we had to, like, buy special tables to put them on. And so, so the, the reason for trying to do it in an online situation made absolute sense because it was going to be so much easier to, to share than the print versions, which could only be, you know, a limited number of copies in limited places. So the more that we can solve that problem online, the better. Oh, hi. Um, I'm Andrew from uh, Core Education. I just had a question for all three of you, uh, probably a bit broader. How do you, how would you define digital citizenship by what you see uh, of the people that work with you most closely? Uh, it's, it's the reason I ask is because I feel like in education we get caught up in a lot of rhetoric and I think digital citizenship is a really broad definition and I think a really good place to start is to find out how do you know you're being a digital citizen and how do you know the people that work closely to you are being digital citizens. So what do those characteristics look like? Because I feel like that's a, to me that's part of the missing part of the conversation here. I, I, it seems quite esoteric a lot of this in many ways, and I think that I think every organization, including my own, can be guilty of that sometimes, and so I'm curious to know what, what you feel is a digital citizen from, from where you sit in your organization. Um, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's really difficult to define, and I can tell you why, because my 13-year-old came back from home last week with a piece of homework, and he said, Mum, you won't be able to help, but I've got to do this piece of homework about being a digital citizen. Do you know anything about it? <laughs> so, um, so I kind of know what you mean about it because then I tried to say, yes, I'm an expert in this. And then I thought, but what, what do I mean? Um, I, think, I think it came down to feeling confident and comfortable in the online environment, as comfortable and confident as I do in real life. So that's a very personal comment. 
certainly from a school perspective, it was coming from the cyber safety angle. So I guess it's safe, comfortable, confident is how I would define it. It's a great question. Um, and, and I think I'll maybe go back to, to part of my previous answer. I think we're in a really interesting phase with quite a bit of choppy water um, and quite a bit of, um, you know, the, the status quo being disturbed. I think if I, if I thought about the direction of travel rather than what's a digital citizen today, you know, you do hear, you do hear talk of digital natives and I'm not sure what the cutoff age is, but it's, you know, it's about 21, 22, I think. But uh, the, so the idea for me is that in the future, uh, and, and probably not too far in the future, our lives will be, um, will be in many ways, the, our life admin, as I described it in one of the slides, our life admin will be conducted primarily in a digital environment, and we will be comfortable with that. It will be accessible to, to all of us, to, this, to the extent that all of life's admin is accessible today, because we mustn't forget that, that people with disabilities have difficulty accessing traditional government services. It's not, this isn't just a digital issue. And in fact, digital can bring new experiences and new capabilities to bear to people with, uh, with disabilities. So it has opportunity as well as downside. So I think in the future, it'll be about um, a much more universal access, universal comfort, and universal ability to use and choose digital whether it becomes mandatory is a different question, I think, because you could see that journey taking to a place where the only way you can do things is online. I hope that doesn't happen in my lifetime, but it may happen in, in future lifetimes. And we've got Philip up the front here. Up the front? Yep. My name is Philip Van Sale. I work in a... Um, small rural um, library. Um, our population is about 11,000 in the town and for some reason we were selected to predominantly do our census online. So the examples that you quoted, Alison, were all live examples from what um, we experienced. But what was interesting is that the consequence of that, and I want to leave that with you, has been that a lot of, we have a large Pacifica population there, and this is in the south of the, um, uh, middle of the South Island, which is a bit of a contradiction, but it is a fact. Um, a lot of them didn't have the, uh, the skills to do it, and the results of the, cens um, of the census was less than uh, 600 Tongans. And we immediately knew there were a lot more in our town. So the local Pacifica organizations and also the uh, Pacifica Affairs have done, their own, have done their own census and basically looking at the enrollments at the school and they've come up with more than three and a half, between two and a half and three and a half thousand. It was quite difficult to pinpoint it. So when we are planning council services, everything was based on the less than 600 and it is a problem that you will definitely have in Auckland too, the silent group of people that we need to accommodate. Um, so it is a real practical problem that we have to address and again the, exactly the same um, situation, very limited funds, so we have to work with, with other or organisations. So I'm just leaving that with you for comment. Um, I think what you describe is a probably increasingly widespread issue. I know that in Auckland they struggle to get the census forms delivered into all the apartment blocks and to all the people, the people who lived in each apartment block and so the reach um, is, is getting harder. And, I mean, 
we tried to um, publicise it really fully so that people were aware the census was going on and what to do, but you know, it's still really, really hard to, to achieve that 100% coverage. Alan. Alan Smith from the State Library of South Australia. A question to all three of our panellists. Uh, to ask for your thoughts on what I think is the gap that has come out of this morning's discussion, that there's been a drive from government to deliver services online and to give people those choices. Within libraries and other community spaces, we've had to react, and it has been a reaction, react to that with helping people with those. Where I see the gap being is what work, what conversations are being had with citizens about what they perceive and what they want from government in terms of being a digital citizen, what services, what type of services and the how. Because it seems to me with our wonderful new office of digital transformation in Canberra, the emphasis needs to be on the transformation as opposed to the digital. And so it just seems to me that we talk very much about the new digital world being two-way and co-creation, but I think what we're seeing at the moment, at this stage in the process, is that it's still being very much top-down driven and there's very little actually coming from the citizens about they want, how they want to be a digital citizen. I value your comments, please. Look, I think, um, I think it's, again, a really well-made um, observation that go gov government is very used to sitting inside its own construct, um, sitting inside its own rules, you know, and to, and to the point of it not being intuitive. It's, you know, legislation isn't intuitive. It's not written to be intuitive. It's written to prescribe exactly what we are entitled to as citizens or exactly what our obligations are. Unfortunately, you know, I think we've all, as government departments, focused really hard on getting the, getting the implementation of the legislation right, and we've, and we've not really thought of, and what's that going to mean for the citizen? How is the citizen going to, going to be able to deal with that? So there's a legitimate, you know, there's kind of a legitimate reason why government does what it does. However, I can't talk about what the DTO is doing and how Australia is thinking about this, but I can talk about how New Zealand government is thinking about this. And now this is government policy. And government policy, in, in very much in a delivery sense, is to put the citizen at the centre and is to say that, that working with government starts with the citizen or with the business and then moves into government, not the other way around. And so, so some of the research that we've done on the back of that um, going out and researching uh, with citizens has, has come up with, with some of the things I mentioned earlier that very much citizens want government services to be part of their lives as opposed to something they have to go off and do separately. So, so if, for example, you know, an example of that might be um, if, if you want to travel somewhere overseas, then when you're on the Air New Zealand website, it pops up and says, hey, I notice your passport's expired. Would you like to get a new passport? As opposed to you having to then say, I'm going to off to do a separate thing. So, so that was a very strong theme from the research. The second strong theme from the research was the removal of what, what were described as pain points. And we've talked about a few of those this morning already, that, uh, uh, that the, the online experience breaks down. You, you get so far and then you can't get it any further. You know, and, and if I reflect an example of my youngest, who's now in her second year at university, the transition from school to university was quite painful in terms of how we had to administer that. Because we, we could do a little bit of it online, and then I had to go and get a solicitor to confirm that she'd passed NCA level three. The government already knew that, because she did it through Wellington Girls, which is just down the road here. So the government knew she'd passed it. They knew that she'd got a, a very good mark. And yet, we had to get a certified copy to send to another government department. And these are the things that citizens have reflected back to us through that research. Um, and hence, the, you know, the government has a very clear policy on put the citizen at the centre, design the services from the citizen's perspective. And we're finding that really challenging. 
because at the other end of that is the legislation that we administer, which is another, you know, that's, that's the key role of, of government departments is to administer the legislation. So it's causing quite a bit of choppy water. <laughs> Again, another example that, you know, we're in this, this, this changing period. Um, but that really fundamentally, I think, is what's going to change things, is government departments shifting to think citizen first, business first, and then agency second. Um, well, I find what Colin's just said really reassuring, actually. And if you could have a chat to our Digital Transformation <laughs> Office, that would be great. I, I keep trying to. <laughs> um, I rather like the idea of an Amazon-style approach to government. So, you know, you like Medicare, you'll love Centrelink. Um, sorry, that was for the Australians. Um, I, I'd just like to mention, I think Colin's covered that side of it off really well. Um, there's a very good initiative happening in Victoria, actually, at the moment, with the State Library of Victoria and Public Libraries of Victoria Network. Their shared leadership team is putting together uh, a toolkit for libraries to measure their readiness for e-government. Um, and how they're engaging with uh, citizens, but also how they are preparing for it. I think part of our frustration in libraries is that government initi initiatives happen over here. People are coming in over there and asking us for help, and it's the first we've heard of it, or we've heard of it, but we've got no inside track, no inside information. So I thought the suggestion of the, the dummy census or the dummy voting was just fantastic. I'd love to see us working more closely with government departments in that way. Um, and I'll wear my local government hat to answer this one. Um, we're very aware that um, ratepayers, residents, find local government very hard to deal with, very siloed. So we've been trying to do a lot of, of customer-centric design, and for example, using the scenario of setting up a new restaurant, you know, where you need maybe a resource consent and a building consent, and you need a food license, and you need an alcohol license, and you need a license to put chairs on the footpath, and goodness knows what else. And at the moment, those are all entirely separate activities, but really they're part of one process. If you work through, this is the whole thing I have to go through. So there's a massive project going on um, in our council at the moment to integrate all of those and make it one online experience uh, for people as much as possible. And the role that libraries can help with that is that we're often aware of the points that customers are facing frustration because they will sometimes come to us and ask for the help of what do I do now? So we can occasionally feed that into those design processes or into design of new council website where we're pointing to the fact we think you, you absolutely need to talk to this group of customers because we're aware that they're a group who are having problems. Can I just add to that? Um, in our department, the Department of State Development, we've got a fabulous new slogan, uh, which is no wrong door. So whichever way you come into government, whatever your query is, it's not, no, we don't do that, that there's to be a referral, that whichever door you come into, that's the door, is the entrance to what you need. All we need now is another three or four years of very hard work to actually make any of that happen. But we've got the slogan. <laughs> um, we've got Winston and then Debbie. Thanks. Uh, Winston Roberts, National Library. Uh, just an observation and maybe possibly a question to Alison. Um, we're talking about the relatively new concept of digital citizenship, but nobody's actually mentioned the concept of citizenship. Uh, we're assuming, I suppose naturally, that we all have the same concept or understanding of the meaning of citizenship in a Western-style democracy. But we are also a multicultural society with increasing numbers of immigrants from smaller ethnic communities, from, uh, from other cultures and other countries and other parts of the world where they may have different understandings of these basic matters. I just wondered whether uh, perhaps, Alison, you could tell us if there's any provision in Auckland libraries, since you mentioned lectures, talks, uh, sessions for the public, if there's anything on civics education that would be oriented to the needs of immigrant groups in their languages as well as English, for example. 
Is this, a, is this an issue? I, th I think there's probably a, um, quite a need in that area, but I'm struggling to think of anything that we actually do in response that is as formal as civics um, education. I mean, we do a lot of work with people on a one-on-one -on -one basis to help um, direct them to agencies and um, help them, you know, create spaces where they f can identify and feel welcome and safe and make connections with the community. But in, in that formal response, I don't think so. I see Greg nodding at me. Um, so, yeah. Uh, not so much in the civic space, but certainly in life skills. So at the Lianza conference, there was a presentation from some colleagues of ours around um, showing people in a library how a self-check machine works and then uh, extrapolating that out to this is how an ATM would work. And so quite a lot of stuff going on in that life skills space. And I would imagine that in those conversations, you know, uh, around about voting time or submission time or long-term plan time, that the conversations would, would cover those sorts of topics. But I think there's more we could do formally ar around civics for a diverse community. Mm. If I can just mention it is, that, that, that is a bit of a topic at the moment um, around central government where there's, there's a, I guess, a realisation that there are a number of departments that, that have a role uh, or a potential role in, in what you might want to call a sense of nationhood. I, you kind of use the term fairly loosely. So there's people like ourselves um, where we, you know, we're the department that administers the granting of citizenship. Uh, you know, we also run visits and ceremonies office, which um, helps um, royal tours and, and, and other things. We have the office of ethnic communities. Um, and we're doing a lot of work through those different channels, uh, working with other colleagues in places like Ministry of Culture and Heritage and working with the Ministry of Education to say, is there an opportunity here to take a more coordinated approach to this, um, to the development of the sense of nationhood? And, and in there, I think, sits civics um, and the, the potential for you know, civics education or, or at least civics being a topic. So it's at the stage where there's a recognition of an opportunity uh, and we're thinking about, so how best might we start to um, promote that? And I think it is absolutely on the back of a recognition that the demographic makeup of New Zealand society is shifting and shifting quite dramatically. And so again, we're looking to form, um, to see how we can form a sense of, a more dynamic sense of what civics education might need to be and a more dynamic sense of what a nationhood conversation might encompass, uh, and one that is forward-looking rather than having too much referral back. Although, of course, our history is important, but our future is also important. So we're going to have um, Debbie and then Vic, um, Victoria, um, and we've only got about six minutes to go, so that might have to be it. OK, thank you. Um, this is probably directed more at you, Colin. Um, it's interesting listening to all of the speakers talk about the role of public libraries. Um, as digital hubs and, and really enabling um, our, our local citizens to participate within that, that, the whole democratic process, et cetera. Um, and I talk, you know, listening to you talking about joined up thinking, and it's great to hear some recognition being given or thought to be given to looking at programs and, and in terms of how we can engage. Um, but at the end of the day, and I think Sue alluded to it when she was talking about the digital hubs in Australia and how the funding had moved, and, but they've given it another name and again, obviously sounds like they're looking at some other form of funding. At the end of the day, it comes down to money. And what I haven't heard is any discussion or any willingness really for central and local government to sit down and look where these roles actually sit and whether there's opportunities for partnership in terms of funding. Um, because I think at the end of the day, we're all trying to work in the same space for exactly the same people. And I think it would make a lot of sense um, yeah, for, the, for, for central and local government to actually sit down and talk about financial models in terms of delivering these services. We, I mean, it turns out we've had, um, we've had at least initial conversations through local government New Zealand um, about, this very, about this very issue and this very topic. And we've had 
we've had you know a recognition and uh, that that this is this is something that we want to understand much better you know it, you know, we all know that we're working under constraints and, and, and always will. Uh, and so what, I'm, what I've suggested is that we need to start building up an evidence base that's, a, that's reliable, that goes beyond, um, you know, reliable anecdotes are great, but they're still anecdotes. Uh, and so actually LGNZ has gone away to think about, well, how can we actually gather some, some data around that and some facts? I, I'm, I'm not sure how they're getting on with that. But, but I think when we're able to have a dialogue that's based in some facts and data about what is actually happening, what are the expectations, how are they, how are they manifesting themselves on the ground in real practical sense, I think we're going to have a better conversation about, so what might the right response to that be? It is always a tricky conversation between central and local government to say, you know, who funds what. Uh, but you're right, in the end, it'll, some of it will come down to money. Um, and, the, and I guess, again, back to this theme of us being in choppy waters, you know, as you, as you ramp up digital services, and this applies to, to both central and local government, as we invest in digital services, we put money in there, you cannot close down your traditional services. And all other industries, you know, the banking industry saw this in spades. You know, they put in ATMs thinking, fantastic, we can start to close branches. Well, they soon found out that not only do you, for every one over-the-counter transaction, you get two and a half uh, electronic transactions. They found that people still wanted to go into the branches, despite having done that. So suddenly, they've, they've, upped, their, they've upped their cost base. And we are going through exactly the same thing in both central and in local government. We're actually increasing our costs by, by developing digital channels. And until we can start dare I say it, closing down traditional channels, we won't realize those savings. So it's a really, it's a really gnarly issue. But initial conversations have started. LGNZ are, are due to come back with, at some point with some, some more better information about that, and then we can look at, okay, what might we do about it? So Victoria, the last question. Kia ora koutou everyone, um, my name is Victoria Ray, I'm the product manager of gov.nz. Um, I'm just reflecting back, so this will be nice and quick probably, um, about the uh, themes of low literacy being quite an issue for digital citizenship and just you know, being in society in general. And it's just something that we've picked up um, with our user testing, um, that how people interact um, online is very different depending on their literacy levels. So that's where we've been trying really hard to um, bake that into how we design and how we make sure we use really simple language and um, you know go cross cross agency. Um, and, there, and there is you know often quite a bit of resistance from other people in government, you know, thinking it's dumbing it down um, rather than just making it easy to use. And I just also reflecting that low literacy. Um, that actually works, we've found in our research, really well for older people as well. So what works for low literacy community works for older people. So it's, it's that um, idea of making something really well um, for one group. Um, actually, you know, good design um, is, is good for everyone. Good, you know, inclusive design, accessible design is really uh, good for everyone. And I think that the work we're doing with older people is really promising. So that's a, a cross-agency, multi-agency group. So. You know, with the idea of making um, this information access, access and services easier to use, I mean, hopefully that also, um, you know, makes things easier for people in the library, because we've had uh, lots of interactions um, with public librarians, you know, recognising that they're at the coalface and they uh, know what people are experiencing. So we've been, you know, trying to get the feedback loop in um, and work closely and make it easy for them to make it easy for people as well. So it's just more of a comment, so that's nice and quick. Thank you. Can I just say, that sounds absolutely excellent, and, and you're absolutely right. Literacy underlines all of this. Um, we found if you, if you write for a 12-year-old, then you can hit most of the population that has a, a basic literacy level. So. Victoria's going to hate me doing this, but can I just acknowledge the work that she's been doing in this area? Because it's, it's, it's really, she's, she's slightly undersold it, I think. Um, when Gov.nz was launched 18 months, about 18 months ago, after a lot of beta testing, you know, li you know sort of limited live testing, all the rest of it, um, it was launched and it went really well. And then the team came to me three months later and said, look, 
We're really sorry, but we want to make some quite fundamental changes to the look and feel of the site, and we also want to change the pitch of the language. And it was quite a big change. And, and you know, we, we did it, and it was the right thing to do. Um, and since then, the team has been relentlessly using analytics to track the way people are using the site um, and, and to really work very hard on getting it as accessible and as usable as possible. And, and it's kind of, you know, of course everybody tries to make things work really easily, but I just want to acknowledge the work that, that you've done and the team have done because they're a really good example of a team that has put the citizen at the centre. They've absolutely been driven by citizen response, analytics to see what's ha actually happening on the site, talking to users and working with an extended community. So it really is, I was just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. And thank you for that, Colin. I mean, that, uh, just following up on that, I think you know, it is one of the examples of um, one of the um, success stories of, of IKS and the, the placement of GIS and, and National Library and, and Archives together. Um, we've been able to work um, together around that engagement with public libraries. Um, the team come to two lands of conferences now, um, and that certainly has, has been a really beneficial relationship to foster in terms of the development of that service and also the exposure of it uh, into communities where we know people are actually looking for that stuff. Okay, well that brings us to time. Um, I think that's been a fantastic first session. Um, so thank you to everyone for great interaction and especially thank you to our panellists for being so open and engaging. Uh, can we pull, please put our hands together for Colin, Alison and Sue.